a series of drawings that are called Amend. The ones that are in the show are the, th the three most recent ones from a series that's had a number of variations in terms of size and, and whatnot, but uh, basically this Amend series since uh, 2007. Um, and the other body of work is some sculpture, bronze sculpture that uh, goes back to uh, in the 90s, I can't even remember how when I started, it might be useful. Anyway, so, um, I'll get to that. But uh, it's, yeah, sort of in the, uh, 1995, I guess is why I did the earliest ones. And it's a series that went on for about 10 years. So that's, I tend to do that with my work. I work in printmaking, sculpture, and drawing in some combination. So sometimes I'll be concentrating on sculpture, but I'll have a, another series of drawings that's kind of running along parallel, and sometimes they intersect, sometimes they don't. Uh, or, you know, with uh, prints, I might have done a series of prints and then that'll lead to some drawings or... So they, they, there's just this kind of back and forth between different media. And I t do tend to work on series for a long time, but they, they're usually interspersed with other things. So uh, this uh, uh, series of amend drawings that are called Fold are uh, 22 inches by 30 inches. This is graphite. And um, they're, all of the amend series are based on the idea of like a wreath or a, a bouquet. And the, one of the notions about it is that both the wreath and the bouquet are very um, symbolic arrangements of, of flowers and botanical components that, that are used to um, express love or to honor or to, to memorialize, to express mourning. So a variety of things are, are expressed through this idea of a wreath or a, um, a bouquet. And um, in these works, the, the, there's a lot of different botanical images that have been taken from different sources. So all the botanical references I use are found from um, uh, mostly what I call domestic textiles, so things like curtains, uh, tablecloths, sheets, and stuff that are and that I find by chance in secondhand stores and whatnot. And I've got just mounds of this stuff that I've been collecting over the years. So I'll take a, a certain element from a, a piece and then do something with it, like enlarge it and you know turn it up inside out and do a mirror image of it or something. I could work on it a bit, but then that becomes like an element that I put into my bouquet. So it's like I kind of weave these things together, uh, not literally, but that's sort of the idea behind it when I draw. Uh, so it isn't collaged or anything, but it it's brings together a lot of different components. So uh, the, um, and th these recent ones are quite a, a change from what they've um, been usually like. What's happened with these series um, is they're it's kind of got this um, kaleidoscope sort of effect to it. It's like a, it started out with a trip to Sicily where I got very interested in Sicilian tiles. So what, what happens in, this, in these images is that if you can imagine that what the, the image is actually like this, a quarter here that instead of it being just one quarter of a thing that carries on to be you know, other things, I just use that one quarter and I repeat it. So I flip it over, do a mirror, so it turns it. So it's, it's one component that's, that's done four times. So it meets in the middle and makes this sort of kaleidoscope thing. So it, why I was interested in that, or what struck me was looking at Sicilian tiles, is that it's um, a lot of the work that I've been doing with references to botanical things is, is about this idea that it's not, I'm not talking about an image of nature. I'm talking about how we, as culture use images of nature. So there's a, a quite an artificial kind of quality to that. So this, this sort of way of kind of repeating the image seemed to be very artificial uh, that kind of fit in with some of the interests that I had. So, um, so this is, you know, this is using, you can see that there's some, what repeats in these is some of the stuff that's in the middle. Some, some images, they get repeated, but they're different sizes or something, but they, 
So this is taking another quadrant from that same, what would have been a, you know, a, an intact sort of um, uh, bouquet thing, which, but I don't actually have a drawing of that, but it's using those same components. So one of the things that I'm interested with these works is the different styles, the different representational styles that are in all these found things. And they, they cover a range, like some of them are, some of them are quite old, the fabrics that they have, some are like very recent. And what, what sort of is the same about them is that they're, they've been thrown out or they've ended up in secondhand stores or flea markets or something because they, they went out of style. But what, re, what went out of style is the color. You know, there's these peachy things or whatever. So usually the, the, a lot of, there are certain styles of representation too that, that occur at a certain period and then disappear and then come back. But more than the actual style of the, the graphic style, what really makes them uh, kind of not something you want to have around anymore is, you, is the color. And I take the color out of that, so it just emphasizes the form. And I tend to, with, with my work, because I feel primarily like I'm a sculptor even when I'm doing drawings, I, I've never been interested in color. I never really knew much what to do with color. So what I'm interested in is form. So, uh, and I, I am interested in how all these different disparate styles can be kind of brought together. So every component that you see here, every, like every flower, every leaf, everything here is, is um, you know, taken from a, a different piece of fabric. So they're in the original state of even wildly different colors and they're, you know, but they are, they're different styles of, of graphic representation. So that, just that whole thing interests me a lot. But I just use pencil uh, and there's, there's nothing, no ink or anything. Just pencil 2B to 9B is what I use. Very simple. Because I find that um, the, um, oh, okay. that the, uh, with sculpture I tend to get into things, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, And then press some wrong part of it. I'm sure you did. Uh, they, with sculpture, I sometimes get into fairly complicated. Let's see other file. Um, you know, like I, I did bronze casting for quite a while, which was really, really complicated. Or you know, ceramic stuff, which gets very complicated. So I find with uh, when I'm doing drawing, I like to just keep it really simple. I don't want to add more complication. Uh, with doing drawing, since this sculptural stuff often ends up being very complicated. So that's, uh, that's why I just stick to just pencil. Well, just as an aside, there's a new documentary on Apple TV. It's not on Netflix yet. Yeah. The Pencil. It's about the history of the pencil. Oh, yeah. There's a, I, there's a couple of books that I've read on it. It's well, quite one, fascinating. I just watched it the other night. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of companies that um, have been making pencils Ever, for hundreds of years, years. yeah. 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 <clears throat> oh, wait, look at you, Marcus. What if IT genius? <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is the, the third one. You can see some of that, that sort of sunflower thing that's quite black. It sort of reoccurred there in the middle and on the edges, but you know, not the same scale and stuff. But, um, but some of the elements that are on the upper reaches, like they, they never reappear. Anyway, so um, it's when I, when I started this, it's you know a lot of times when I'm working on I'll, I'll be working on one thing and I'll get this idea. Oh, you know, I want to try this. So then I'll you know just kind of move off into something. So this seemed like at the beginning, like this was sort of interesting. It made sense with some previous work and stuff. But I had no idea how complicated this was going to be because when I start the first section, like I just you know I'm kind of drawing what I want to draw, kind of how I feel like drawing. So that's fine. But then when I move to the next part, if this thing's going to work, I not only have to look at you know what I've originally started with, but I have to look at how I drew it the first time. But now I've got to draw it like from a completely different angle, or maybe upside down. And it's just I had no idea how difficult that was going to be, and there were just times where it just absolutely drove me crazy. So, but what I learned over time is it's really only important in the edges where they meet. I can you know kind of go off and do go a little bit off the rails on the outer edges. And also, as long as I keep the tonal things 
right? That that helps a lot too. But, but it's impossible to do it the same. So you didn't use any any electronic manipulation? No, no. No, I'm totally analog. <laughs> but I was also wondering about that. So it's not a mechanical reproduction at all. No. Each, so we could, if we got up to these drawings very closely, we could, there would be differences, yeah? Oh, yeah. And yeah. there's some, like, especially if it, I don't know why, when I started, I thought that, you know, it would be hard, this part in the middle. I thought it was just lines. I'll get a lot of the area covered there. This part here, oh, man, it's mind-blowing. So if you look at it up close, you can see there's lots of things where... Oh, that didn't match, or look, that's not right, or oh, I had changed her mind there. So there, oh, there's plenty of stuff that's totally wacky, but it doesn't. Like, like tile making, and yeah. I'm sort of surprised because you do print making, like you could do a print plate that's a quarter of that, right? Pull yeah, and I know, but I, <laughs> I You never thought of print making on this? Uh, no, I thought when I, I mean, I guess I could now, but, I, you know, I, yeah, but, Thing, but it, uh, th that's another thing, though, that, that is a part of my work that I do seem to, like, labor, the actual act of, of working is very important to me. And the, the idea of, like, spending a lot of time is, is really a big part of the work. And I know that, like, that's, they, you teach that to people in, in first year art school, like, just because you spend a lot of time, that doesn't mean it's any good. But somehow, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I think that, you know, the fact that you spent a long time somehow does add, if not, maybe not to the quality of the work, but it adds something to the meaning of the work. Yeah. There, it gives something to the work. And uh, I was interested to, to find, put together at one point, that the word laboratorio, which is Latin but also Italian, that's the word that they use in Italian for studio. Studio means room. When you're, so when you're talking about an artist's studio in Italian, you don't say studio, you say laboratorio. So the studio is like, it's a laboratory. And the, the word laboratorio as a, as a Latin word includes both the word for work, labor, and the word for prayer or devotion, which is ora. And I think that's, that's really interesting. That, that seems important to me. So at the time, the fact that this took a long time, and there's other ways I could have done it that would have been easier, that that's sort of irrelevant to me in a way. It's, it was important to spend the time. Mind you, uh, I do have because this is you know there's there's only three of these now. There should be four. It's important to me to do the fourth one. But once I've done the fourth one, I'm not sure I'm going to do any more of those. Originally, I thought, oh, I could do you know, and that just at the moment I'm not thinking of doing any more of these ones. <laughs> Take a break. So this is a uh, this is actually a Sicilian tile. Uh, and uh, they, it, in Sicily, they're really big on floor tiles, and they, they, they don't, um, you know, it's, it's things that are, are meant to be, like, cover a huge surface. So the tiles are often quite large, and often the patterns are large, too. Like, they, this one's maybe not the best example, but there's things where you, the pattern, like, it takes, like, you know, 12 tiles or something to make. And the, the whole thing with tiles, I think it's very interesting that the, it's, a very ancient thing that's in a lot of cultures, but the idea of covering a floor or a wall or possibly building the tile is very, very ancient. It goes back like thousands of years. And I think it's, you know, like it's sort of possibly the first example of, of a piece of art, a manufactured thing that's, that's you know, both practical and decorative. You know, like long before carpets, long before lots of other things, the, you know, there was tiles. So, and in, in, in a lot of different cultures. So, I, I find that interesting. So, this is an earlier Amen drawing. This is going back to one of the first ones, which is, what's the date on this? I can't start to remember my own work here sometimes. Two, yes, 2007. 2009. 2009. <laughs> oh, it's right here. Oh, that's handy. There you go. <laughs> I forgot about that. So, um, so this, so this is so. That's there. There's a lot of water under the bridge um, uh, between this one and the, the ones that are in this show. But one of the things that, so maybe it's a bit clearer on this to see it. But so this is doing the uh, the, the stuff that that the other ones are too. But it's, it's a bit, I think. 
easier to see that you can see that each element is taken from something else. It's, it's a different style of making an image. And uh, what I did with these, the, the men part, is there's there's a sort of a cut in yeah. each piece or an inset, which usually it's you can see it more clearly on one thing. You just notice it on one component, and then you start to realize, oh, every element has something like that in it, but it doesn't it doesn't show at first. So that's you know that was sort of the the basis of this idea, these and end things, but. Um, so your botanical references you were referring to were drawings, and you were, you wanted to imitate the style of those drawings. Well, they're they're all from found fabrics. Everything is is everything is found. It's found from like it's a, a piece of uh, curtain or tablecloth or whatever. But sometimes it's, it's elements of clothing. But you know, so it's just some you know little scrap of something that I you know found at the, the second hand store. So it's so each. Flower, each leaf, each whatever, is is taken from a different source, and in the original piece of fabric, there'd be like wildly different colors. Mm -hmm. So do you try to be quite faithful to the rendering of that source. Or do yeah. You change it? Yeah. So that's why that leaf on the right looks a little more like high contrasty than the others. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. it's, it's. I. I just. I go with you know sort of whatever. Is there? Now I think um, I didn't realize it uh, when I did it, but then after finishing it and looking at it, uh, some components of this turned out quite a bit differently from uh, most of the other stuff I've done because there was two. Well, they're from the same piece of fabric actually, but this um, um, it turned out, which I didn't think of it, looking at the fabric, but these two pieces were from the same fabric and. They don't look it in the actual fabric, but uh, it's, a, it's done very photographically, it's a, it, rather than, a, than something that looks more drawn or something. So it, it, it has much more of a graphic look than some of the other stuff. Anyway, that's sort of the nerve. And this is a, this is still these man things. This is a, a, a more recent one, but before I got to doing the, the kind of tile ones. Um, so it has the same thing. There's cuts in each thing, and there's every every elements from a different. This is kind of a bit washed out in some areas in this light. But anyway, there's you know every every component is from a completely different piece of fabric. So the the, the way it's been handled is quite different. And some of these things are quite nice fabrics. Some of it's like really junky stuff. So what you're, so what you're saying that it's from different components. Like to make up this composition, you would have pulled from this fabric and that fabric. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they're so it's like you know the, it's like I'm picking my flowers out of the big pot at the, the florist. Thing. Okay, I want this one there, and I'll take that one, and you know. So they're but each so each element I'm looking for like as, as much contrast as possible. Yeah. So do you you had mentioned wreaths and uh, bouquets in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Do you think that what you're making is simply a composition of found? Um, images from fabric, or do you think you're making some kind of composite wreath or bouquet? Well, I think of it, in, yeah, I think of it as being, you know, kind of a of a, uh, a wreath bouquet idea. What um, what I use actually for some kind of um, structural ideas for them are I've got a lot of books that I've collected on flower arranging but stuff like from the 40s and 50s because they d did very artificial things there was kind of an early influence of people discovered Ikebana and stuff and went all kind of haywire with him <laughs> some really weird space age kind of floral arranger so I get some ideas from that from these old books but yeah so I see it as being you know sort of a reasonable thing and so the other component of the show is this series of uh, bronze tools that I call practica and that I worked on from, oh, what is it, well, uh, I don't have the dates there, but it's in the, in, from 19, sort of around 1990 and up to about 2000. There's sort of four different series. So um, there, I make them in wax and then I, you know, uh, go to a foundry and cast them. So the idea with them is that they're they're fictional tools. I, I thought of myself I was making an archive of fictional tools. So they're 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 made up and they're, they're sort of they, everything 
each tool you can see, okay, that's sort of the handle, that's where you pick it up, that's the end part, and, and the thing that's that where you would do something like shovel or cut or dig or something, that, that's turned into a, a kind of a leaf-like thing. So they, you know, they kind of changed and went weird ways over the times that I made them, but you can see actually in the background, this is an installation from a another show, but you can see the uh, three drawings in the background. So um, before I started uh, making the, t the tools, I was working on these drawings of tools. And I thought, you know, the all of my work, I think, it, could, it falls into sort of the idea of, of surrogates, like not using figures, not referencing um, people in my work, but using things that bring human culture into the conversation so things like books tools architecture clothing are all things that I've, I've used in my work so with the tool drawings i um was doing this kind of museum display they're called history lessons the order of things which is you know they're precisely about not really having an order but they have that look of an arrangement like a museum display as if these things are in meaningful categories but usually, they're all stuff that, that I found, that I had, like other stuff I had around, some of them are tools that were in my studio or something, and other things people gave to me and things I found at flea markets and stuff. And once I started showing these drawings, there were so many people who came and said, you know, I've got these things in my garage and I don't want to throw them out, but I don't know what to do with them, but I'm gonna give them to you if you want them. So I got boxes full of stuff from people. and. Um, Anyway, so the with these there, each tool is you know accurately um, depicted. You can see the, the other ones too. But anyway, the um, but there's no there's no consistent scale. So while so I was working on those sort of uh, for a while, and then I got the idea that um, I'd like to you know make some sculpture tools. So the, the first thing I did was this. Uh, 1990, this uh, series of 13 bronze reliefs. So they're about 6 by 9 each one. And I, I made it 13 as opposed to 12 because, you know, because it referenced the baker's dozen. Because they're all sort of domestic, or supposed to be domestic implements. Some of them are, you know, sort of things you can recognize, but a lot of them are just, they're, they're based on something but kind of tweaked a little bit. So they're not actually things, but but they're all things that sort of reference the preparation or storage of food um, was the thinking behind it. And um, so uh, it's called Gather, Arrange, Maintain. So it's about, you know, collecting, gathering, and, and arranging and maintaining. Um, so after doing that, I thought it would be interesting to, you know, sort of make actual uh, physical tools on a, on a table. So be, before making this, this, these are ceramic tools, this is done 1993. Before I made these, I'd started doing the drawings. So after doing some of the drawings, I thought, that'd be interesting if I have, I've got drawings that are, that are real tools. How about if I make some tools that are fantasy, but the tools will be real because they'll be three-dimensional objects. So the thing that's an abstraction, the drawing, is actually real. And the thing that's, that's a physical object <coughs> is a fantasy. And something about that kind of interested me. So this is, uh, these are ceramic tools on a steel table. And they're, they're made you know, to, to look you know, like a, a, a museum arrangement. And so, but they're, they're based on things you can sort of imagine, like spoon things or but they're, they're, they're made up. <laughs> and then I made, uh, then I did one in bronze and um, had a lot of problems with this. Then a lot of the things, um, a lot of things went awry with this. Like there, there was a, a lot more to this piece that just never passed and um, some of them twisted and turned the way they weren't supposed to. Because I worked directly in wax and then take it to a foundry. So there's a lot that can go awry uh, when you cast, because you're taking something, you know, that's cold and you put it through, you know, thousands of degrees of heat and then it comes out, you know, completely different material. And so a lot of, a lot of weird stuff can happen. But did you 
finds interesting stuff and weird stuff that happened? Did you sometimes prefer them? Or? Yeah, so what uh, this experience actually got me thinking, you know, I should really play up more the the, the whole process that's going on here and, and you know, not try to have it uh, end up too perfectly. Uh, but along at the same time, I was also doing a series on books. And um, so the, the book series were interspersed with the those uh, first tool things. With the book things, these were also bronze. So I was making the waxes in my studio. And um, I got onto this thing that came actually from some earlier drawings of the open book that there's sort of this kind of organic thing growing out of it. So the text has become these kind of plants or something. Um, so I, that's, I did a series of these books with kind of a leaf thing growing out of the middle of the, the pages. So what happened was here I'm in my studio making leaves for these books, but I'm also making you know these tool drawings and, 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 and handheld tool things out of um, ceramic or wax and then but then the, the, the things just kind of crossed over so I started taking some of the leaves for the for the books and putting them with the tools so that's how the tools ended up with this leaf on but you can see in this one this is where I started to really get into the idea of I'm going to let the process of the casting sort of do whatever it wants to do and I'm not going to fix it up what, what you do if you usually if a traditional way of casting in a foundry is you make the wax or even maybe just a plaster mold and they take the wax of the foundry and then it's, you know, when you get it out of the, the, the uh, after it's been cast and you got all these holes and things on it, you take a grinder to it, you grind off all the extra stuff and you weld on all the, where the holes are. So it's kind of, you know, you, why bronze is expensive to do is not the material per se, it's the work involved because you basically make the piece three times. First you make it in wax, then after you've cast it, then you got to remake it, it just goes on and on. But, um, so what I decided is, I'm not going to fix it up. If, if there's a big hole missing, I'm leaving it there. If, you know, a page fell off, too bad. I don't need it. You know, I just going <laughs> to go, go with what's there. So that was great. Because why should something that's made out of wax, why should it end up looking the same after it's been, you know, burnt all to hell and, and, and you know, now is weighs a ton? Like, there's, there's no reason that it should be the same. So that's, they, they got this very, very organic thing from because I didn't fix things up. But I also, I knew that, okay, if I make it really thin here, maybe I'll, I'll get some holes or something. Or, or if I make this, the, the handle here, like really kind of, you know, go kind of really thin at a certain spot, then maybe it'll twist or do some, make some kind of gesture that would be really hard for me to make in the wax. So... But, you, but but sometimes you know as these things go, when you want it to come out perfect, you get all kinds of weird holes and twists. When you when you hope it's going to do that, it doesn't do it. But. So that sort of hole that, missing the top of that leaf thing that that definitely wasn't in the original plan. That was fine. And, but another thing that I got into was trying to take something like with having the the leaf and the, the handle part, which is a branch, trying to keep them looking as natural as possible, and then seeing what little information I need to add to it to turn it from being something that you could come across in, you know, on the ground or in the woods or something and, and instead into something that you know for sure has been made. So, you know, it's really, it's just that the little handle that turns it from being something natural to being something manufactured. So I got interested in trying to, to find how little I needed to do with that to, to create that change from being something that you'd see in there. So here, like, the, the, it's like, like just really, really tiny little information there. Of, of the, you, you know, okay, that part, that's not natural, that somebody made that part. So I, that just became sort of something that interests me as the years rolled by, <laughs> I made more of them. So this is one of the, the later ones. Jane, can you tell us the scale of these and the book? The book well, it's... Um, kind of handheld. Yeah, the, oops. Um, if I could go back, to, like the uh, okay. the yeah. the one on the, the installation one I make here again, um, because it, they're they, the tools have they're very hard to to measure because they're such irregular things. So um, they're uh, like this one is you know I mean it's it's sort of 
you know, about something like that. But then some of them are quite long. There's a, there's quite a, a range in the in the, the lengths. Of they're them. sort of actual size. As, as yeah, this is yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, there's there's, and I made all of them that they uh, they've been shown in several ways. Like some, I did make them originally that you could just ha ha like have something on the handle, a little hole or some little thing that that you could see that, okay, if I want to hang this up, I'm just going to hang it on a nail on this part. Like, I wanted them to be treated very casually, like you'd hang tools on the wall in your studio or something was the idea. Uh, but, yeah, so they're, um, they have the, the size very, but some of them are quite long and ungainly, and, and some are um, more compact. They started up smart. Hey, see, originally, my idea was to put them on the, these tables, these sort of, to have this sort of museum-like thing, and, and the table is, um, you know, on an angle, and was, you know. So, but after, so I, I did those first two on the table, but then the next round of things, I mean, they, they started to, to get too large and ungainly, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna make them, you know, force them to be on something that can fit on a table. Like, why do I have to do that? I'll just, so I just, I just let them, you know, sort of go wherever they want to go, and then, they just became things that could be put on a, on the floor, on a plant, hung on the wall, like whatever. So I lost the table part where they were much more. Uh, kind of, this, is that? Yeah. Makes sense. Anyway, yeah. So you like those drawings are 22 by 30 inches, so it gives you a sense of the difference. Did you yeah. have any kind of interior monologue going as you're uh, uh, producing these things? Like what these tools might be used for each one? Did you did you have like oh yeah those scenarios I, yeah, that it was sort of, yeah. and I, I thought of them uh, like we don't you don't see too many on this table and I have I haven't got the individual there's some that are more like scissors yeah. you know I was, I was thinking of like things spoon like things scissor like things digging things I think of the, the sort of things that you do the various things you do with a tool and there's actually not that many different. Uh, Things really. Um, Marcus, can, help, can we go just to the, the the ones at the end, just directly, without having to go um, back, or is that in this presentation? Yeah, because there, I think there's still a couple of images I haven't shown. Yeah. I think oh. we're gonna. I'm gonna have to oh, just okay. just okay. go through them. Okay. Because I'm good, but I'm not that good. Okay. <laughs> oh no, we've gone back to the beginning. <laughs> Oh, slides used to be so much easier <laughs> before we had all this gotcha. wonderful new tech. Stop there. Okay, I think this might be there. So this one, this is a, a later one where you can see uh, I've got some nice um, sort of bending and, and uh, stuff going on in the in the uh, hand, the in the part to pick it up, and the handle again. It's just like just you know doesn't need very much information to tell you. Okay, this. This isn't a natural thing. It's been made, and I have. There's a little hole you can hang it on a nail in, in your workshop or whatever. And uh, so I, what I uh, got interested in too was I always wax the um, the handle part, like the part where you you feel like this is where I pick it up. I always make sure that that's waxed so that people can feel. Yeah, I could pick it because with um, with the kind of uh, color patina I'm using there. You don't want to touch it if it's not waxed because it'll affect just the moisture from your skin and the oil will affect the color. So you, you don't want to touch bronze, patina things that haven't been waxed. So, I, But I don't wax the other end because you're not going to be picking it up there. So I, I was I kind of, you know, showing people where if you were going to pick this up, this is where you would pick it up because you naturally recognize that there's the handle. That's where I picked that thing up. So, but yeah, it mostly was about, you know, kind of, the idea of uh, of maybe cutting, digging, um, scraping, you know, but not, you know, just sort of those basic kind of tools. So that's uh, what I have here. There, are, in between all these things, there's other other series of drawings and stuff that I've done. I couldn't, if we maybe, what about how about we go to that other folder just briefly? There's a couple of quick things I can show you here. That, um, the, um, oops.
Oh, uh, this is, um, these are, I've got a couple of Busby Berkeley images here. The, uh, that kind of kaleidoscope thing uh, that I've got interested in the tiles and that idea of something that's botanical and mechanical. I started thinking about uh, Busby Berkeley. I don't know if people have seen those films from the, the 30s. He did these big extravaganzas in musicals and movies in the 1930s where there was enormous groups of women that would, you know, make these patterns uh, on the, 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 it was always filmed from above. Jackie, please show you. The Jew Taylor dancers, the that's Taylor it. Dancers. Yeah, like there was, the, the sort of last vestige of that was in the 1950s in early television where there was this program called the Jackie Gleason Show that was really big and it was based on the old kind of variety shows and they had this, there was that was the Honeymooners and stuff which was like uh, quite an interesting, not, well it was funny but it, it was this kind of, uh, anyway, it, it, it's kind of like a play really. But before that they had all this kind of vaudeville and entertainment stuff that had nothing to do with the rest of the program. And they had this kind of cut down TV version of the Busby Berkeley routines, the June Taylor dancers. That was like the last sort of vestige of that stuff in the 50s. And of course it was much more cramped because a, a TV studio wasn't anything like a sound stage in Hollywood. And But anyway, yeah, and the, the, I guess the other element that is kind of referenced there is maybe synchronized swimming, which <laughs> it's one of those things it's hard to, to see if you because they're underwater. But yeah, that's like the June Taylor dancers. I, I, to me, as a child, that would, to me was the most sophisticated thing that I knew of was these women in these gowns making these big patterns. I thought that was like, there was, that was like the most magical thing in the world. You see how deprived we were? <laughs> here's, here's another. Now this one, this is great. The, do you see the guys that are, like these sort of waiter guys or whatever? That are here, lying down on the floor, and their heads are like you know turned to the side so they can continue to breathe, sort of. But uh, they just wacky stuff, but amazing things. Like they're just the most incredible thing. There's even I couldn't get good images, of, but there was a Busby Berkeley thing where the women had these kind of feathered dresses, and they get into this formation where it looks like a poppy waving in the wind and it's just it's unbelievable the effects that they got and this is in the 30s black and white uh, like all the, the the things of it the movies are black and white so all the images of it but there's no color in it but it just but fantastic stuff and how how we even sort of imagine this I don't know but yeah the, but there was you know all these sort of dance routines that made these incredible patterns so and, and there, this is another uh, reference for me from um, but the tool things I was doing this uh, German guy uh, Bosfeld I think it's the name I better check on that for sure but um, he did in the early 20th century black and white photography he was doing he was he was a teacher who taught in you know kind of industrial art stuff like welding and stuff and he um, wanted students to learn to make forms from plants, but it was too hard to keep the plants alive long enough for them to study them. So he came up on his own with this method of, he wasn't really a photographer, and it was very early days for photography anyway, came up with this idea of just putting plants on white pieces of paper and just photographing it with his big camera. And this is what his students used to learn how to make convincing forms in, you know. Anyway, so it, they're very beautiful things, amazing images that he did. That are quite fantastic. And but so these are these are from plants. So these are all plant forms that have this amazingly kind of manufactured. Well, these are like pumpkin tendrils, I think. So all of his images are actually from plants. But some of them, if you just look at a, some some of his work, you, you think it's like a pile of, of mechanical bits and bobs. You, it's hard to believe that it's from plants. So, it, there, but this is, he was doing this like in, you know, the 1918, 1920. You can see kind of an art nouveau influence him. This is another one. Okay, so they're all completely natural, but they take on this incredible artificial thing. So as I see, I see there's a it's kind of a, a tie in there with the, the Jim Taylor dance. <laughs> Must be Berkeley. And this is, this is an image of uh, broccoli that, um, 
uh, what do they call it, Romanesco broccoli. But the patterns in this, you know, this is, you know, that whole thing with fractal, fractals, the kind of mathematical kind of uh, growth patterns in nature. I mean, there is this kind of, it sort of looks like some busby Berkeley dancers spinning around there. So, you know, this, this kind of, this division between the organic and the inorganic or the natural and the, and the manufactured and, you know, I don't think they're, you know, they're not quite as firm boundaries as we think sometimes. Uh, this is another installation of the practical piece with, with some drawings in behind. I think I have, yeah, this is um, in around doing the event drawings. I've been working on another series of drawings. It's called Book of Hours. And these are based, uh, coming again from the, 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 the book form, an open book with a, uh, some organic thing coming out of the, the pages. So I started doing some drawings that were referencing that, that had like two different panels of pattern things and then this wreath in the middle. And at a certain point, I just kept with the wreath and forgot the, the background stuff. So that the book part of it maybe isn't quite as um, readable as it used to be. But this, this, is a, this is a very large drawing. This is about, uh, well, it's 55 inches across and about 80 inches long. So the name Book of Hours is part of like, this take a really long time to do. But uh, it's the same idea of these, each components from a different piece of fabric and it's got a different, uh, different kind of representational style to it. Um, but, uh, and it's, you know, this kind of breeze bouquet form. But they're, the scale is the big thing in that. So you've magnified the scale of what you're looking at many times? Or what was the scale, or is, are you true to the scale that you're looking at? No, actually, uh, what I, I do, um, I did, originally I did start out this way, but at a certain point after things got really big and really complicated, what I ended up doing is I make what I call a maquette. So I, 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 I do, um, I Xerox stuff, especially if I want to mirror image it or like to, to get sort of sizes and stuff. Or So then I make a, like a small, uh, drawing, but it has where I want to place things and, and about how much space you know I want them to take up, and then I just have like a, a vertical and a, and a horizontal line on it. So when I start my drawing, I make a very pale uh, vertical and horizontal line, and then so what, what's the middle of the paper both ways? So that, that then I can use that as a guide. Okay, if I'm going to put this element here, then it's going to take up this amount of space, just so I could have something like I don't want it to be this mechanical thing but at a certain point when I was spending like months and months on a drawing I didn't want to suddenly have everything go haywire you know at the last minute and it you know ended up going off the page or something like I could do that but that would be a different a different drawing but so that's so I, I just I know about how where I want I know where I want to place it in terms of where it is to the middle in both ways and then about how much space I want to take out so that's that's sort of, but then the rest of it, I'm just kind of, I'm looking at the the fabric that is coming through, and, and, but also a lot of it is how do I take this thing that's on this piece of fabric? How do I represent that uh, using a pencil? And it, and it's something that's all about color, and this isn't about color; it's about tone. And just because sometimes they're you know, I mean they're not always very linear things, so. And what I've done a couple of times in this too, which is something that I hope to, to uh, do more of, but I, I haven't gotten uh, too far with it. But there's a couple of components where there I actually used, um, drew like from dried leaves that I found in the garden, so they got holes in them and stuff that are kind of eaten up. And because I, I thought that was like an interesting, a more direct reference to the, the tradition of still life. And it was something that I kind of wanted to, to do a little bit more of, but I, I, I've got sort of focused on these amend things, so I haven't gone back to that. But that's something I, I think I'd like to do uh, later if I can. This is a Spanish photographer um, uh, named Juan Foncuberta, who I discovered more recently. And when I first saw his work, it was in a book on, on contemporary still life. And I thought they were plants. And I thought, she's a kind of weird one. Anyway, then when I read up on what he makes fake uh, flowers, 
and they're all out of industrial things like bits of rubber, bits of plastic, they're bits of metal. It's all like industrial kind of manufactured materials and he creates plants that are then photographs and very much like um, Bosfeld yeah. and, and actually he specifically references Bosfeld and he calls this series a herbarium and they're they're like these totally made up plants and they're um, and, like these are two separate images and when I first saw them I thought well that's really interesting you know these decayed plants but there's nothing natural in these things they're all like uh, chicken bones and <laughs> weird pieces of rubber and stuff so it's quite odd but they they, they function uh, well, in sort of the, in terms of photography, because you know so much of the history of photography has been about photographing things that are actually <laughs> so it's a big adventure for photographers to do stuff that's not real, and it's very meaningful in the context of photography. You know, I think for the rest of us, it's not that significant. But I, you know, it's sort of it's been a big revelation in photography. Wow, I can make stuff up instead of just photographing what's out there. So he's he's very. Uh, uh, well known in, in Europe and, and highly regarded in terms of photography issues. But I did find, I was taken in by them, I, I didn't realize that they were totally manufactured until I started reading. I can totally I see the connection between yeah. this stuff yeah. and what mm -hmm. you're trying to do. Yeah. But you know, this, a very strong reference for me that comes up looking at your work is uh, grotesques. Uh -huh. yeah, and, and, and the kinds of uh, designs that you would see in Renaissance yeah, buildings and, and, and yeah. all of that stuff where yeah. plants are, 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 are being mixed up with human forms, uh -huh. right? And there's a, there's a transgressive aspect to that. Now yeah. you don't have, uh, uh, I've noticed no figures in your work. Mm -hmm. and, and, but where yours is like, you've got plants fusing with like it's synthetic and natural, that's mm -hmm. your fusion, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Do you see that as a transgression? Because the other thing that, that the way much of your work is arranged, like the tool drawings, is kind of museological taxonomy, right? Mm -hmm. That's being sort of laid out, laid over all of this stuff that's perhaps sort of killing the possibilities of things mixing. Oh, well, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, that idea that things could yeah, get a lot wilder and odder. Before they're so well organized. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't. I don't know. I think. Um, I don't think of myself as particular as being a very baroque person. So maybe that's part of it. That well, I, I didn't say you were a baroque I'm person. Exactly. No, but, but that that my, <laughs> my, maybe I'm looking for the, that component of, of control. But you know, it's an interesting thought. I have to muse on that. But um, yeah. So. Any questions? I guess we're going on here too long. I'm just curious if you could say a little bit, because you've had like private galleries, but you also exhibit a lot in public venues. So just in terms of your career, like kind of a lot of people will maybe just go only the commercial route if they get a private gallery handling their work. Can you talk a little bit for the benefit of people here? Well, about I mean, how I... you've done both or how you approach that part? The, well, in terms of uh, artist-run centers yeah, or public galleries, so like a lot of these, you've had you said a retrospective yeah. tour, right? And I think you've also had a commercial gallery all along. Yeah. So why do you do both? Well, I guess I haven't. Uh, Most I never. I didn't. It wasn't like a a political decision or philosophical decision or anything. The, uh, when I was a young artist, there was a lot of artists run spaces that had a lot of money that were doing all kinds of stuff. And I, I did, uh, you know, a lot of projects and things with artists run spaces. But I, I didn't, I guess, um, I don't know, a lot of times I didn't think that my work really fit into, uh, like a lot of the artists run spaces, maybe less so now, but at one time, in the 70s and 80s, artist run spaces often, they each of them took sort of a, a, they had kind of a sort of category or some sort of space that they were working within that kind of defined the sort of stuff that they were going to do. And so, you know, they had, certain ones had certain kind of, sometimes fairly rigid sort of notions about what was appropriate work to show. Uh, but also, I guess, I don't know, I never, like, I've, I've, uh, 
you know, if the opportunities come up, I've, I've shown where where I've been able to. And I, I like, I, I sort of fell into doing some shows uh, in museums quite early on without, you know, really expecting to. Like I did, I had a big show at the Art Gallery of Hampton. I was still a fairly young artist, where I I read some things about um, the guy who was the, the head person at the, the Art Gallery, and it, it seemed like he was doing some interesting shows. So I just sent a package to him, said, I, you know, I really like the shows you're doing. I'd like to come and meet you. So I just went expecting, you know, we'll just have a nice conversation maybe with him, and he might give me some tips on who I should maybe talk to about showing my work, and he said, oh, I, I like what you're doing, I'd like to give you a show. I just about fell over, like that, that wasn't what I was expecting at all. But then, they, so that was like really great, because they had, you know, this was the first time I'd really worked with a museum where they had staff, and they had, you could say, well, I don't like the lighting. You go, oh, sure, we'll get some new kind of lights. Like, it was just, it was like, just amazing. It was, it was thrilling, but um, certainly unused, you know, not what I was used to, but. But then there was there was a time when there was an a artist run center that had, had I'd had some brief conversations with about doing a show. But then then later she said, "Oh well, I don't think we can show your work because you've you've had a show in a in a public museum, so you're not the kind of artist that we want to show." So <laughs> so it's like this this is the sort of thing that was going on. So I, you know, I never had that kind of rigid thing. Like, you know, it didn't never seemed that, you know, different to me. But one does notice that there's, you know, I mean, no, no institution has the, the staffing and the infrastructure that it really needs. But you do notice when you work at a public gallery that there's, there's more money and there's more help around for setting things up and getting decent lighting and advertising and stuff than there there tends to be in a, in a, in a. A commercial gallery or an artist run gallery. In, for, in terms of commercial galleries too, I didn't, I just kind of fell into being in the commercial gallery. I didn't actually specifically pursue it, but an opportunity came up and and so, and I found, um, yeah, you know, probably I might have, if I hadn't been showing regularly in commercial galleries, I'd maybe, my work might have developed in a different way. I think I think when you are with a commercial gallery, it does there's some parameters that get sort of set? Like they are trying to sell the work, so I think maybe inevitably, it's some, somewhere along the line, maybe you sort of self censor and think, well, that'd be interesting. Oh wow, well, but yeah, the, the Paul's going to say, well, I can't sell that. So I don't know. There might be a little bit of that that goes on, uh, but I I try not to think about that too much. But um, yeah, and it, for me it was good to be with the gallery because when I moved from Toronto, like a lot of, when I was a young artist, I was in Toronto, there was just a lot of stuff that was happening and you'd hear about things or you'd run into somebody and, you know, like there was a lot of opportunities that came my way because I was there and I noticed that, that a lot of that fell off when I moved to, to Waterloo to, to teach and, you know, because then you're not around, you're not hanging out with people and they sort of forget about you. So you know, I realized that there was a number of shows. I thought, yeah, I should have probably been in that show. How come they didn't remember that? <laughs> so, so for me, having a, a place that in Toronto where I could, could consistently show was was a, was helpful. Because if I didn't have that, I think it would have felt very isolated. And but it wasn't something that I thought through as a strategy. I just realized in retrospect that. I, you know, so there, there's good things and not so good things about having a, a dealer. But generally, I think you know. Um, I mean, there, there's in Canada, there's there's a lot of opportunities, but you, you sort of have to make them for yourself too. But sometimes stuff just does come your way. Like I, well, when I look back, I think, geez, I, I wasn't really very strategic in a lot of ways, and I was lucky. Certain things happened, and I just took advantage of them. But. Team. So I think this is not very helpful. That was very <laughs> interesting. That was very helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you. And good luck to everyone in your work. I think that the, the, uh, it's very hard to give advice as what you need to do as an artist because everything you can, every strategy you can mention, then there's you can find tons of examples of people who did precisely not that and it worked out, or who did that and it didn't work out. So. But I think the main thing, what I always said to students and what I've always said myself, the main thing is to do your work. Because whatever opportunity might come by, whatever 
thing that opens up. If you haven't got the work, then you can't take advantage of it. So the main thing is always make sure you have a space and make sure you can you know, set up your life somehow that you can give a good portion of your energy and your time to making your work because everything is going to flow from that. You can't sort of try to strategize things and then you haven't got the work to sort of back it up. So, And that really is, is the, the pleasure of being an artist, is actually making the work. A lot of the other stuff is either not that interesting or sometimes quite unpleasant or like really nerve-wracking. <laughs> the only really fun part, or there's boring parts too, like labeling your images. The, you know, the, the most fun of being an artist is actually being in your studio and doing the work. So that's, that's what you need to focus on. That's my advice. <laughs> so I hope you all can come to the show. And uh, thanks for your wonderful <laughs> IT support there. Too tired to How many signs up for the uh, things today? Are you going to be able to come to the show? Are you yeah. For the oh, you're going, you're going tonight. And I can take At the city of okay. visits. Uh, what time are you? Four? Okay. No. Okay, so it's going to be six or eight. I'm going to sign up too, I think. Okay. Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, Darren, you're at the door, right? So, maybe you could go at 3.30 and I'd like to teach Darren. Sure. I'm not sure anymore. I'm out there at 3.30. I think I've, I've got one water on the boat here. I might keep it. Oh, yeah.